Well, let's open to the end of your Bibles. Grab your Bible or the one in the rack in front of you. They're, they're in the pews too. And open to the very end, Revelation 22. So that's one everybody can find. Just go to the maps and back up, you know, and find Revelation 22. And we're gonna look at verse nine. And, and what I'd like to share with you this morning, I call it Worship 101. And we're gonna look at who the true worshipers are because when we finally get to Revelation 4 and 5, we're gonna see who it is that gets to worship God. But for you to connect in your mind what we're doing, Revelation 4 and 5 have two basic elements. The first one we're introduced to is the throne. And we've spent week after week after week looking at the throne basically from every angle you can look at it. The second element of Revelation 4 and 5 is the worship. You see, all the worship of the universe, all the worship of the redeemed, all the worship of all of our hearts and of all the hearts of all the redeemed throughout all time, all goes before the throne. That's the destination. And we have looked at where it's all going for quite a while. Before that throne where God collects, now he doesn't collect all worship because there's worship of false gods, God doesn't collect that. There is false worship of the true God. God doesn't collect that. There is self-styled, not commanded by God, worship of the true God. And God doesn't collect that either. But there's the true worship, which is based on what he's told us he wants. Of the true God, he collects that. So all worship from all worshipers of all time directed toward the true and living God, the way that he desires it to be offered, shows up in front of his throne. So this morning, what we're going to look at is the last chapter of the Bible. And by the way, to introduce you to verse 9, John, the apostle, he's the one that wrote this, God inspired him to, has been in a perpetual state of amazement. Now, he starts out in chapter one, many months ago we were there, and when he first saw Jesus Christ after the resurrection and glorification as he ascended and was seated at the right hand of the Father, when John saw him the first time after that, he fainted. That's chapter one. A perpetual state of amazement is what he's been in for 21 chapters. Now in chapter 22, he persists in that state of amazement. He's repeatedly been overwhelmed. And once again in this final chapter, John sees such amazing sights. All he can do is fall down again. Now the last time he fell down was in chapter 19. And he's falling down again. And basically the, the lead up to verse 9 is that John is being led on a guided tour of heaven and he he is so overwhelmed by the angel. Now remember a few weeks ago I talked about angels and the 12 kinds and all that and I said the totality of all the angels is nothing compared to the one that made them. If you think of all the, the splendor and power of all those angels, collectively they're not a, anything compared to what God is. Yet one angel the one in chapter 22, verse eight, that's leading John around. That one angel is so magnificent, so powerful, so overwhelming. What does John do? He starts to fall down and worship the angel. That, that should make your minds think. If a created docent, you know, just a tour guide of God is so overwhelming, that one of the greatest of all the apostles, one of the writers of, of a lot of the scripture, one who knew Jesus face to face, is so overwhelmed, he starts worshiping him. Can you imagine how great God is? See, that's, that's why these things are written, to show us how great is our God. Well, John is corrected by the angel. That's what the context of verse nine is. And in this exchange, when the angel corrects him, we realize that worship is declared by God to be the very central theme of the Bible. In fact, what he says, look at, look at verse nine. Then he said to me, that's the angel talking to John. See that you don't do that. See, he's giving him the stiff arm. He says, don't do that. I don't want to get in trouble. Don't you bow down before me. I mean, that's... He actually says it a little more calmly, see that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. 
But now look at the last two words of verse 9. You see, God reduces down everything that we are created to do and to be to two words. One of them is worship. And the other is the destination of that worship. Worship God. That's an amazing correction that the apostle needed. He got caught up with the throne and the crowns and the lightning and the creatures and the white robes and the thunderings. And then the glistening city, he just got overwhelmed. And the angel says, uh, worship God. That's what you're created to do. That's what you're going to do forever. That's the central theme of the Bible. As we get here to the final chapter of the final book, it's where we see the final word on worship. God gives us the final word on worship. And he does so in the very last chapter of the book. It's almost like he's saying, if you haven't caught it in the other 1188 chapters, catch it here. Everything you're created to do and to be comes down to worship God. Two words. In fact, when you see all the people at lunch, if you're going out to eat today, and they say, oh, what was your church about today? You say two words. Worship God. Theme of the Bible. Theme of my existence. Well, God instructs us on the most important of all subjects, worship. A simple definition of worship would be worship is honor and adoration directed to God. And so if we worship God, we direct our honor and our adoration. Now, the Bible says that we're supposed to be known as God's worshipers because we direct our honor and our adoration to him. I wonder if people that live around us, that work with us, that go to school with us, that see us, know that we worship God. Or does our life show that we honor and adore our job? Or we honor and adore collecting more clothes and wearing them? Or having more money and using it? Or in our devices? Or in our accomplishments or our talents? Or what we look like? Or what we've done? You know, we, we constantly are honoring and adoring things. It's what we talk about, it's what we tell people about, it's what we show people. You know what worship is? Honoring and adoring God. And we're supposed to have a life of that. And you know what I think? I think worship gets crowded out by us, honoring and adoring everything else. And so we're really not good at honoring and adoring God. And it's not just when the music's exciting. It's supposed to be every moment of our lives. And anything that takes the spotlight, takes away the honoring, takes away the adoring of God should become something we're suspicious of in our life because it's robbing God of the honor and adoration that he deserves. Well, here in heaven, there is no subject more important to God's servants than worship God. The worship of God, the scriptures say, is the mark of true believers. Philippians 3.3 says, for we are the circumcision. You know what that means? We've had a circumcised heart. We've had a heart transplant. We're born again. We worship God in the spirit. We rejoice in Christ Jesus, and we don't have any confidence in the flesh. So worship is the mark of true believers. Always has been, always will be. The worship of God is declared to be the content. In fact, turn back with me to chapter 14, Revelation 14. I want to show you something that is fascinating to me. Worship of God is declared to be the content of the eternal gospel. The gospel that is forever. The gospel of heaven. The gospel of eternity the gospel that God preaches through an angel in chapter 14 to the world. If they want to get 
out of the destruction of the tribulation, if they want to get into the calmness and the peace and the joy and the delights of God's presence, there's only one way. Worship God. Amazing to think about the content of the eternal gospel. True worship of the true God is the truly the key to everything that matters forever. That's what the Lord's saying. And the angel says, John, don't get carried away. Worship God. But look at Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, because here in Revelation, uh, God says, this is my final word. I want to declare the centrality of worship and the importance of worship. Here in Revelation, God makes so clear because of the moment that he preaches this sermon. I'll, I'll read verse 6, chapter 14 of Revelation. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. Now John, remember, is the narrator of Revelation. He is the one watching all this. He has been given the privilege of being the one who God chose to, to see the future and to write it down as best he could, inspired by God, free of any error, giving us the future written in advance. So actually, in many ways, chapter four and five, what we're gonna to get to in a minute, is us seeing ourselves in the future. One of the few places in the Bible you can actually, you know how people get pictures and they always look and see how they look in that picture. And in fact, the first thing most people look for is whether they're in the picture, you know? Well, the good thing about Revelation four and five is if you're saved, you're in the picture. And we see ourselves in the future. But while we're up, you know, worshiping the Lord, look what's happening on earth. This angel is flying around the midst of heaven. What is he doing flying around there? Well, in chapter 6, the tribulation starts. In chapter 7, the Lord deploys the commandos. You know, if you've been reading the news, it says that our president now is lessening the use of hundreds of thousands of troops, and he's increasing the use of few highly trained commandos, special forces, special ops. God has special ops. And when he pulls the army out, that's us, the church, he deploys his special ops. That's chapter 7 and 14 of Revelation. And the Lord tells us the special ops are all Jewish commandos. They're, they're from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. I mean, it's interesting for people that, that think there's no future for Israel. Who do they think those people are? I mean, are they 12 denominations? I mean, but, but God picks the 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 crack commando evangelist troops from each tribe, and he sends them out into the earth. And we know they're effective because halfway through chapter seven, after they're deployed, already there are a countless number of converts that are coming and streaming up to heaven from their evangelistic work. But these commandos are just part of God's special ops that he's doing. He sends in two witnesses. And remember, they can call down you know, the, the fire from heaven. They can stop it from raining. They're just very, very powerful special forces. But then God has one last agent right here in verse 6. Another angel flying in the midst of heaven. Now, what's going on here? Well, if you've read 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, especially 9, the Lord opens up the pit and all these horrific monsters start coming out and, and they are pursuing people and the people run in and slam the door and, and lean against the door and when they finally get against the door, they see what was pursuing them is already inside because it's a, a demon and it isn't stopped by doors. And so the whole earth is falling apart. A third of all the trees are burning. A third of all the grass is burning. A third of all the creatures that live in the ocean are dead, they're belly up, and they're rotting on the shore. I mean, we get four whales beaching in Cape Cod, and the news crews are, how would you like one out of every three living creatures, right down to the plankton, dead, floating, rotting? I mean, it's not a pleasant place. And, and, and stuff has fallen from heaven. All the water is poison. There are these, these creatures that are chasing people and killing them. And in the middle of that, God, the Savior, not only has his 144,000 out there witnessing, not only has the two witnesses. Right here, it says, another angel flying in the midst of heaven 
that means it's kind of at blimp level. You know, you ever been a football game and a blimp comes over? Just high enough so you can see it, low enough so, you know, you can hear anything or read the banner that it's towing or whatever it is. And it says this angel is flying in the midst of heaven. And here's what he's carrying with him. Having, verse 6, the everlasting gospel. But it isn't a trail behind the biplane, you know, that, that rides down the beach, you know, at South Haven. He is preaching. He's saying it. And who's he saying it to? To those who dwell on the earth, specifically to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Now remember, since God called Abraham, he called him to be a blessing to every group on the earth. When the Lord deployed Israel, they were to be a witness to all the nations and tribes and kindreds and tongues. When the church was, was born on the day of Pentecost, they were born to share the gospel with every creature in, in all the world, every kingdom and tongue and tribe and nation. There, God has always been into this. But now, when the earth is literally going to hell faster than ever before, he sends the gospel angel. And the gospel angel is circling the earth at just a height where everybody can see him and hear him. And it says, and with a loud voice, verse 7, here's the content of the eternal gospel, Revelation 14, 7. Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him. Worship who? Worship him, verse 7 continues, who made heaven and earth the sea and the springs of water. Who might that be? Well, Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says that it's Jesus Christ. For by him, Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven, that are on earth, that are under the earth, both seen and unseen. He has created all of them and he holds all them together. Now, I don't know if you realize, but we're in a time where our pluralistic society is now in the public school systems having various Islam awareness times. And they're teaching the school children to sing songs to Allah. And what the teachers say is this is religious liberty because Allah is a generic name for God. It is. The true and living God is identified as a creator. The creator has given us his name. His name is the Lord Jesus, Messiah of the Jews, Christ. Now tell that to any any deeply thinking Muslim, that the Allah that I'm talking to is none other than the creator of heaven and earth, the Lord Jesus, Messiah of the chosen people of God, Jews Christ. You won't get those words out of your mouth. But that's the true God. And only those who worship that God are saved. See, that's the problem. And so this angel is saying with a loud voice, and, and, and what, what the flying isn't this, it's this. I mean, he's going around the earth, and it's not this once. It appears that throughout this whole horrific time, as people are running and being chased, and as things are falling from heaven, as, as everything's burning and smoke, and there's no water to drink, they keep hearing this voice, fear God. Worship the Creator. You see, the Lord is really into saving people. He isn't into hiding the gospel. It isn't select few. He's calling if they'll just worship God. Well, notice the angel's message in verse 7 is called the eternal gospel. The message of the eternal gospel. What is the message of the eternal gospel? It's join those from the Garden of Eden through the end of humanity in the millennial time, join those who worship God. Who worship the true God, not a false God, and who worship the true God in truth, the way he's revealed. Not in a self-styled way, God doesn't accept that. Not in a false way, God doesn't accept that. In fact, remember in the Old Testament when people did their self-styled worship and they wanted to do it their way, the Lord burned them. Aren't you glad you don't live in the Old Testament, right? How would you like to come here this morning and think, hope I don't do anything wrong. Don't want to get burned up. No, the Lord says, worship me in spirit. 
being born from above, redeemed through the blood of Christ and in truth. Worship is so important to God. Well, what's the eternal message? Fear God, give him glory, worship him. Those who live forever are those who respond to the gospel. Those who respond to the gospel become true worshipers of the true God. At the end of everything, how does God summarize those who possess eternal life? Revelation 22, 9. He says they worship God. Those who live forever while they were on earth joined the worshipers of the true and living God. Worship God, that's the everlasting gospel. That's the message that God has given from eternity to eternity. Worshiping God is the theme of scripture. It's the theme of eternity. It's the theme of redemptive history. God redeems people to worship him as the true, the living, and the one and only glorious God. And he said, I am the God who has a son. And I sent my son to be the savior of of the world. And if you want to know who the true God is, follow the line to his son and find the one who died for your sins. That's the worship message. Before creation, after creation, in eternity past, in eternity future, throughout all time in between, worship is the theme. Worship is the central issue of creation. God made creation to worship him, And God made the creatures to worship him. Now as we open back to Revelation 4 and 5, that was just introduction to 4 and 5. What we're going to look at is the most complete theology. I call this a theology of true worship. Now, you know, I personally, I have about 30-some books on worship. Some of them are thick and some of them are thin, but they're all theologies of worship. They're they're written by some of the most renowned people of all time about the subject of worship. Every part of them that is true reflects chapter four and five. Because this is the this is everything we need to know from the most important source. This is God showing us what worship coming up from below us here on earth, what worship is acceptable to lay at his feet? What worship is collected by him? What worship is accepted by him? That's what Revelation 4 and 5 is all about. It's about the the worship and the worshipers of God. And it's, it's demonstrating to us what I call worshiping at the highest level. This theology of worship shows us the ultimate of worship. Basically, it's unhindered, focused, and glorified worship. Those in heaven are unhindered by time. Did you know you can be going along in a worship service and it's really wonderful and everybody's worshiping on the Lord and all of a sudden you notice people doing this. You know what's hindering them right then? Time. Did you know what in heaven will be? We won't be hindered by time. There are no hindrances Neither time nor our flesh nor any distractions. We are focused directly on the Lamb and we're bowing in front of Him. We're focused. We're not counting the tiles and seeing which lights are burnt out and, and checking, you know, what, what everybody else is doing. We're completely focused on the Lamb. We're also glorified. You know what that means? No more is our humanness, our sin, or the devil interfering in any way with our worship. That's worship at its highest level. And it's a passage in God's word, Revelation 4 and 5, that gives us this theology of the worship that God wants. So what does he say? Well, this passage is the most complete study from God of worship there could ever be. And as we look at the worship detailed in these two chapters, we see that worship Worship, is, this is the final topic that God gives us in his Bible. Basically, you could say the book of Revelation is all about worship. 
Why? Because where does all worship go when it's offered to God? It ends up in front of his throne. And the whole book of Revelation is built around the throne. And everything occurs in front of the throne of God. And while that is occurring, the tribulation, worship is accruing and being poured out at his feet. This is the last word, the final, the ultimate word. We have everything we need to know about anything to do with worship as we hear these final words from God to us. You know, it's really neat to get the last word on stuff, isn't it? You know, we're in the presidential election season and so we're in the primary season and so, do you know what's going on? All the talking hairdos, you know, the people on, that's why I could never be a newscaster, you know, because uh, they don't have a hairdo. But uh, uh, all the talking hairdos, they're speculating. They say now, oh, coming up, uh, Louisiana's past us. Now we've got some more coming up, three more. Now it could play out this way. Do you know what? I like the final word. That means this morning I looked at how Louisiana turned out after they finished counting. I mean, why sit there and have them speculate all night long? I mean, did you know the amount of time that you watch some of that stuff? You could read entire books of the Bible. They don't even know what they're talking about. They're speculating. Do you know what you need? The final word. That's why I love sports. The day after, look at the score in the paper. Saves hours. I've read the Bible many times, not watching the games, just checking the paper. It's easy. The final word is when it's over. God gives us the final word on worship. And as we look at what God gives, we find he reveals to us what is most important to him. And you know what's interesting? When I read in my 30 books on worship, a lot of them talk about, you know, what the current culture needs and what this and this and ways we can enhance, you know, the lighting and everything else. And you know what I thought? I thought this was supposed to be sent to heaven. God already has the lighting up there. You know what I mean? He's already, he, it's, it's not about us. It's about him. And that, that's the message we get. Well, what elements of worship does God emphasize? Basically, if you look at Revelation 4 and 5, you see that God breaks out five different elements of what's important to him as far as worship is concerned. And, and here are the observations you can make. In fact, I want to make these with you. Look at, we're, we're going to have an observation class and do a theology of worship. Look at the first seven verses of Revelation chapter 4. And as you read those, and we're going to read them in just a moment. That's going to be what we're going to stand and read, but not, not until we think about it. First, what we're going to see in verses 1 through 7 is God introduces to us the setting for worshiping him. Did you catch that? First, God introduces the setting of where the worship goes before he introduces the worshipers, their words, or their actions. Now that's something that's instructive. When God talks about worship, he introduces the setting. That, that's where worship goes in front of him. The, the destination before he talks about who's worshiping, what they're saying, and how they're doing it. It's the, the destination first. That teaches us that the setting for worship is important to God. Did you know that there are only two chapters in the Bible about the creation of the whole universe, and there are 50 about the tabernacle and temple? Do you know what the tabernacle and temple were? The setting that God wanted for worship to be offered to him. Yeah, that, that is a very large thought that we need to, to ponder. God wants our worship to start by us first reverently focusing on him as the awesome and almighty one upon the throne. That's why we spent six weeks looking from every angle possible at his throne, what it's made of and what's around it and, and, it, and where all it shows up. Because that's the first thing God wants us to focus on is the reverent, awesome, almighty on the throne. Remember that pattern for our prayers? Do you remember Jesus left us a little pattern we're supposed to always follow in our prayers? It wasn't Jesus' prayer. It's not the Lord's prayer. He didn't pray that. He didn't say, Father, forgive me of my trespasses. He never trespassed. That was for us. How does the Lord's prayer start? Our Father, you who art in heaven, May your name be hallowed. 
by me. Did you know that's the same thing? Focusing our Father in heaven, that's the place the worship goes. And the setting of that worship is a hallowed presence of God. We need to allow that truth to sink into our minds. God doesn't start with our words or even our actions of worship in heaven. God starts with a very long and detailed survey of just exactly where it is our worship arrives, who is around his throne, and the majority most completely is everything focuses on him because the throne is the center. And he said, I just want you to know that all worship arrives in heaven and all worship arrives right in front of me and I'm the center and that's the setting. Well, the lesson for us is we need to heed the character of God as awesome in holiness, and we need to not rush before him without preparing our minds, without being sure our attitudes are right, and our perceptions of how great he is is tuned up. That's the setting for our worship. Long before the mechanics, long before the content, long before the activity, God says, think first about where it's going. And I, I think sometimes we miss that. I think sometimes that's lost in the, you know, the rush, the awesome holiness of God. Well, to let the setting of worship sink in, let's open our Bibles. Make sure you have your Bible open to Revelation 4. And I want you to follow along. I want you to stand with me. We're going to read it now. Revelation 4, the first seven verses, you follow along. And I want you, as I read these seven verses, to feel the setting for worship before we ever hear the words or see the actions of the worshiping saints. I want you to feel the frame that God puts around worship. Revelation 4, verses 1 through 7. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven... And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here. I will show you the things which must take place after this. Verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, and the second living creature like a calf, and the third living creature had the face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The setting of worship. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Oh Lord, I pray that you'd open our hearts to where this prayer and all of our prayers are headed, where our worship arrives. Before we even offer it, you want us to ponder that. The awesome majesty on high, you sit enthroned and you want us to think about that before we even send out one wisp of worship to you. I pray that you would settle our hearts on living a life of worship, of, of offering worship throughout the day, of doing whatever it takes to stop everything and, and end anything that would hinder or clutter or distract us and just enter your presence. Lord, thank you. Illumine our hearts. Teach us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, but I warn you, it's only the first time. We're going through all of the verses in both chapters, so we're going to stand up more times than we ever stood up in any service. You're going to think that you're in aerobics, okay? Look secondly at verse 8, because the second element God presents to us is that our 
reflective worship of him as his saints are on the throne is offered responsively, in a responsive manner. That's the second thing God wants us to see. When, when once you get this lay of the land and you see what it looks like up there, the next thing you notice is that people aren't saying, hey, I've got, I have a favorite song, I want to sing. It's reflective and responsive. Worship that God is completely in charge of. Remember, he was in charge of it in the temple and tabernacle, and he's in charge of it in heaven right now. He's going to be in charge of it again in the millennial temple. When God is in charge, the worship is this way. You could not worship God for 1,500 years without being stunned by the setting. Gold, all these tapestries, fires, brass altars, incense. Everything was intended by God to communicate where that worship was going. See, God wants our worship to reflect him and where it's going. And that, that transforms it to be very carefully done because he said so much. Okay, our worship around his throne in heaven is not individually prompted. It's divinely prompted. Notice the first glimpse of our worship takes place at the prompting of those burning, living creatures. Remember the ones with those four faces? The ones Isaiah bumped into that were burning, that Ezekiel said were living, that John says are like both of them? Those burning, living creatures, the seraphim and cherubim, first take the stage to lead our worship. Isn't that interesting? I mean, there's some great people around that throne. I mean, David wrote a lot of this stuff. He's there. Moses saw it first. I mean, Paul wrote so much. But they don't step forward. The first to take the stage to lead our worship are those burning living creatures. And above all the sights and colors and sparkling crystal, those creatures loudly declare, and what's the very first thing out of their mouth? They loudly declare the holiness of God. And they don't say it once. They don't say it twice. They say it the number of times in the Hebrew language that, that gives maximum impact. Three times. Last night, uh, we were watching old home movies. Um, we, one of our children stopped in to visit that lives out of town, and we thought we'd entertain them by showing them the pictures of them as a little child. And, you know, I've converted them digitally so the film won't break. And, and uh, we watched about 15 or 20 minutes. Do you know what the comment was? My son said, did you know in all 20 minutes of all those people I saw, not one of them went like this. <laughs> Have you noticed that most people can't go more than two minutes without it peeping, buzzing, or something? or they've got to post something, or take a movie or a picture. He said, for 20 minutes, people just walked around, looked at trees, pushed him in the stroller. No one was on their phone. And you know what? It was almost agonizing to watch. We want everything moving faster. I mean, 10 megabytes per second is not fast enough for us. We want faster speeds. God, he says, over all the sounds of the rumblings, all the voices, all the thunderings, is a cry that pierces through heaven that God Almighty is holy. And we got the message, and he repeats it, holy. And we go, hmm, and it comes again. You see, the Lord wants us to reflect him and he is almighty and holy. And it's at that instant when those cherubim and seraphim, when they say that, 
At that instant, everyone and everything responds. You see, worship is reflective of the character of God and responsive to what God wants. We respond to what God, you know, it's just like salvation. Salvation is initiated by God and we respond. You know what Paul said? I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. God reached down, knocked me off my horse and convicted me of my lostness and I said yes. Salvation is of the Lord. God initiates salvation, we don't. God initiates worship. And he wants our worship that he initiates to reflect him and to be a response to who he is. And so at that moment, in verses eight, nine, and 10, nothing else matters to everybody in heaven. And by the way, nothing else takes place. See, that's, that's another element of worship that, that you know it's of the Lord because when the Lord is leading the worship, all of heaven stops to bow. Every conversation ceases. Every activity halts. Everyone's thoughts focus on the one sitting on the throne. That's reflective worship. We're just reflections of God. We are just reflecting back his glory. We are just responding to who he is. Okay, time for another stand up. Look in your Bibles, look for verse eight. And let's, with Bibles open, stand up again. And I want you, as you stand, to listen and feel the reflective worship of him, our God, as the saints around his throne offer responsively to what those burning flaming ones are doing. They offer their worship back to the Lord. Verse eight. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him, who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. Verse 10, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, and that's where we end, and you may be seated. And I want you to think about that. Because first, God says, I want you to know the setting where your worship's going. Second, I want you to know I'm going to prompt the worship and I want you to reflect back what I'm showing you. Here's the last one this morning. We, we only get to stand up three times. Okay, look at verse 11. Thirdly, God reveals to us the content of our worship is completely focused on him. Not only are our eyes focused on him, not only are our bodies pointed toward him, but the content of our worship is completely focused on him as the glorious, honored, powerful Lord. That's verse 11. And you can look at verse 11. Every word we will say in heaven is so carefully chosen to lift his name high, to make his work the focus, to reflect our gratitude that he wondrously saved us. That is so foreign to us today. Did you know most humans are trying to make themselves great? They dress so people will notice them. They buy things to impress people. They post things to, you you know, what our social networking generation has done is everyone brags about everything. And few have time left to brag about God and to focus on him. We're so consumed with ourselves. Note God's worthiness alone to get the glory It's not ours. It says that he is worthy in verse 11. You're worthy, Lord. We're not. God is to be honored. We don't want to take anything of his glory or his honor for ourselves. Have you ever thought about the six-winged creatures? Do you know why they have six wings? It says two 
they cover their faces. Two, they cover their feet. Actually, that's a euphemism. If you remember when Saul covered his feet, do you remember what he was doing? He was in the cave. Do you remember covering his feet? It's, it's a term for modesty, actually. Worship is humble, it's modest, and it's completely focused not on the person, but on the object of the worship. It's amazing what happens. Look at the front row, verse 10. Look at the front row of worshipers, the 24 elders. As soon as the burning living ones say that God is holy, 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 and he's the almighty Lord, they fall down. But what we often miss is why they're doing that. They're falling down on their faces. Why? They don't want their faces to be getting any of the glory. They want it all to be centered on him. That's why the angels cover their faces. That's why the, the, those on the thrones put their faces on the ground. They're saying, I'm not worthy to share in this at all. It's amazing to think about what heaven's like. When we get to heaven, there is a strong aversion to the spotlight. We don't want any of the credit. We want all the glory and honor and power to go to the Lord. Boy, is that different than now. I mean, put a spotlight on and everybody's trying to, you know, get in it or push their child into it. And if you missed it, they'll show you a picture of their child in the spotlight because we all love to get the credit for something. And God says, no, in heaven... They cast their crowns at his feet to declare that those crowns came from him, belong to him, and are only a reflection of him. They don't want to take any of the credit, and they want all the glory and honor and power to go to the Lord. And that's the content of worship in heaven. The content is, Lord, of you, through you, to you is everything. I can't believe I'm even here. And so you know I don't want any credit. I'm going to just put my face flat down and just let it all reverberate to you. That's the content. So to get ready for our part, here's the last time we have to stand up. Let's all stand. And this will be the last one. Let's just stand and look down at verse 11. With your Bibles open, follow along. And again, listen to feel the content of how completely our worship is focused upon him. He is the glorious, honored, powerful Lord. Verse 11. Saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And let's bow in prayer before him. Father in heaven, I thank you just for letting us just tiptoe in. And first you showed us where our worship goes in the setting of heaven. And then you showed us that the focus of heaven is completely upon you. And then you remind us that the content of that worship is us confessing it's all about you and that you alone, and we don't even want our faces in the picture. We want to back out and just have the spotlight and all the glory be upon you. And Lord, you've said that's how we're supposed to live our lives. There's something about being a servant that we want all the credit and all the attention and all of everything to be on our master. So I pray that we'd all grow in our prayer life and remind ourselves as we pray that you are our father seated on that throne in heaven. And we want to make your name great. We want to hallow you. We want to be humble, and we want you to get all the attention. And we'll thank you for what you do in our lives, for your glory. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. 
And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.